So welcome to Political Lineages. I want to say, first of all, Chris Watkins and Caitlin Stout have done such an amazing job with this conference. So thank you so much for all your hard work and organizing. And I have loved the panel titles. Um, I feel like you all did a really good job of reading carefully and putting pieces together that speak to one another and then offering really cool and clever titles. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm Professor Michelle Morano. I, I teach in and chair the English department. And I'm so happy to see Professor Ted Anton here. We were, he, he chaired the first panel I went to this morning so, or this afternoon. So um, it's nice to have this bookend. Um, and we, I just want to say, first of all, that we're so proud of all of the students here who are sharing your work and, um, and engaging in really great discussions. Uh, you know, we weren't sure at first about trying to do this uh, conference in this way, but the thing that I really didn't want to lose was the question and answer portion, because I feel like, um, I mean, the writing is always good and we're, and we're thrilled to have you share it, but we learned so much from the question and answer period when, um, when, when we see you really uh, talk about your writing as writers um, and talk about the processes and all of that. So I'm excited for that as well. Um, I think it would be great, um, especially since we have folks who are, um, who don't have the video on, if, um, as you're listening to the panelists, if you think of questions, it'd be great to share them in the chat using the chat function at the bottom of the page and just capture them as you're going along and then we'll get to them afterwards. Um, but we want to make sure that we do have, you know, space and time for um, a little bit of conversation. So um, I'm going to um, read each bio as each person is about to uh, present. So we'll start with Susana Cardenas Soto, is a Cuban-Mexican-American writer and performance poet from Oak Park, Illinois, and soon to be graduate from uh, the DePaul University class of 2020. Yay, congratulations, woo! <laughs> with a Bachelor of Arts with a major in English and a minor in psychology, Susana's interdisciplinary work explores personal, historical, and literary theories of trauma through poetry, short form prose, memoir essays, literary criticism, and contemporary media studies. Currently, Susanna is the resident writer for the Girl Scouts of Greater Chicago and Northwest Indiana's marketing team. So welcome, Susanna. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to watch all of us speak. I'm going to start today. And I wrote two pieces on my, I guess, political lineages in Mexico City. And so I'm going to read both of them. They're very short. And if I have enough time, I'll do a little explanation. Um, my first piece is called La Cristiada. Though the government could prevent her daughter from receiving a birth certificate, there was no preventing her baptism. And so upon hearing the news that churches were to close indefinitely by that evening, she wrapped her daughter in a lace tablecloth, gripped her tightly in her arms, and ran from her home to the nearest open parish. Underneath the heavy toll of the church bells and the rumble of paramilitary tanks was the clickening click-clack of her short heels on the cobblestone as she passed by her local chapels, each crammed with anxious neighbors. In front of every still open church in Roma were lines of mothers, each woman anxiously waiting on an exasperated priest to perform hurried ceremonies. Every child donned kitchen towels, stockings, their father's dress shirts, all last minute estimations of baptismal dress. A callous woman, she spent most of the time narrowing her eyes at the other mothers with husbands or who cut in line or cried or begged the priest to hurry. She turned her nose up at their anxiety resolute at least that God would favor the steadfast in faith. She exhibited no signs of desperation, even as armed guerrillas passed by the church, even as her daughter's shrill cries broke through the patience of the priest. She remained stoic. And while bullets rained down just a few blocks over, my abuelita was dunked in holy water and the sun, rosy at its corners, melted just in time. 
The second piece I'm reading is called IRA. During my dad's first year at Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City, members of the Irish Republican Army approached him on campus and recruited him for the resistance. Himself an avid and bearded scholar of Guevara, he considered himself well-suited, already a revolutionary of what he wasn't sure. Perhaps it was the prospect of being a threat to national security he was attracted to, the same thing that might have attracted him to marrying the daughter of two Cuban refugees. Regardless, it is humorous for me to think of him at 18, a portly poet with the spine of a jellyfish, face hidden by a balaclava, blowing up bridges for the provost, just for the sake of calling himself a true Marxist. And those are both my pieces. If, if you want to say anything, you have a, another couple of minutes, but you don't, you're not obligated. I think I'm going to leave it for later. Okay. All right, perfect. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so next we have Eva Lopez, who is originally from Zaragoza, Spain, and came to the U.S. in 2014. Before joining DePaul's MAWP last fall, she got her bachelor's in communication and media arts at the University of St. Francis in Joliet with a scholarship for tennis. She is currently the graduate editorial assistant for Dialogo at the Center for Latino Research, mom to her orange tabby cat, Apollo, and a book lover, especially of historic and fantasy novels. Welcome, Eva. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, so thank you for being here and listening to all of us. Um, I'm going to read the very beginning of my story called Little Salange. Uh, it's a bigger piece, it's 15 pages, so I'm just gonna read the first two because otherwise it's too long. And also I just wanna mention before I start, um, just for those that might not know, um, some names uh, are preceded by Don or Doña, which is a respect term used um, in Spain a long time ago, uh, just so it's not confusing when I read it. Okay, and I'm gonna start. The station wagon, dropped on Manolo off at the main gate of the Spanish village of Tauce, a summer Saturday afternoon in late May, 1939, then turned around and sped away in a dust cloud. He stood there for a couple of minutes, immobile and quiet, staring up in delight at the silhouette of the brick Mudejar minaret of the parish church of Santa Maria, which stood out against the loaded gray sky that hovered over the village. It was at that very moment that he found himself back in the hometown, after years of absence, that he was covered with a strange mixture of disbelief and relish how much he had missed it. But this moment of nostalgia was cut short when Don Manolo checked his wristwatch. It was 12.48 p.m. Therefore, he began rest walking along the irregular town paved streets of Chelsea towards the cemetery, where Angelin's funeral was about to begin. The church walls of Santa Maria resonated all over town as Don Manolo walked past the wide open gates of the cemetery making the sign of the cross. Gathered around an open grave in the far left corner, he spotted Don Daniel and Doña Lorenza, among a quiet, small group of children of different ages and sizes, dressed in dark, slightly worn out suits and dresses. Taking his funnel hat off, he headed towards him. It had been many years since Don Manolo had last seen Don Daniel Caro, but despite the passage of time and the suffering endured, which had noticeably aged Don Daniel, and face and whiten his hair prematurely, it would have been impossible for Don Manolo not to recognize his dear friend. Don Daniel's eyes, though more wrinkly around the edges and sadder than Don Manolo remembered, were the same shade of green as always and lit up when they saw Don Manolo approaching. Don Manolo, you made it. Don Daniel greeted Don Manolo after turning with a hug. I'm so happy to see you. Although I wish our encounter occurred under different circumstances. As Don Daniel said those words, the brief spark of cheerfulness faded away, and he ha in his eyes became clouded with grief again. Don Manuel gripped Don Daniel's shoulder and said, Daniel, please accept my deepest condolences. Poor Angeline and poor Lorenzo. Losing a son and so young is the hardest thing a parent will ever endure simply against nature. Don Daniel, perhaps speaking out on the real pain in his words or simply out of cordiality, he inquired about Don Daniel's family. When Don Manolo's mouth twisted in a pain grimace and looked away, Don Daniel grew concerned. Did something happen to Don Manolo? What is it? Don Manolo, sh Don Manolo shook his head at his own house. It was definitely not the right time or place to talk about his own sorrow. 
It's Gabrielle, he sighed. We haven't heard back from him since he, since he took off back in 36. Not a single letter, nothing. We don't even know if he's dead or alive. The man paused, deciding to withhold certain details about his son's departure. It was probably best nobody in this town knew, just in case. I expect when things settle, we might be able to find out. They usually have lists of some sort, he said. Don Daniel nodded in silence, then patted his arm. I'm sure we'll get news soon, now that the war is open. Don't lose hope, he might be alive. Perhaps he simply has been unable to communicate with you. The Manolo had been gripping to the same unlikely hope, but each month that passed without news from the sun, his heart sank a little bit more. Angelin's funeral felt almost like an ominous premonition of Gabriel's fate, and he felt sick to his stomach at the distressing thought that it could be him burying his own son next. So that's the beginning. Um, thanks. Um, I, I don't really get, you don't really get to know more the war and, and the circumstances uh, surrounding the death, but this is actually closely based. Um, it's a family story. Um, uh, Don Daniel is actually my great grandfather, and uh, Angelin was my grandma's uh, older brother that died during the Spanish Civil War. That was between 1936 and 1939. Um, so it was actually um, a taboo in my family how he died. Not even my grandma knew anything about it. So I decided to um, explore this mystery um, during my history fiction, historical fiction class um, last, last year. And um, I started by Googling his name and I didn't expect anything to really pop up, but all this information came up uh, in published books and journals and everything. It was really surprising because there were so many people dead in this war that Nobody really even knew what happened to them. It was really, really exciting to find out. Um, and it was really hard to approach this, this subject in the story without just being very sensitive about it because I know my family was going to want to read it too uh, because they knew nothing ab about all this. And it was a really enlightening process to just discover uh, so many things about my family. And I knew I had to write it. Uh, uh, and I'm glad I did it for my family, especially. Thank you, that was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on and welcome Himashi Jayasundara, is currently a senior at DePaul, studying writing with a concentration in creative writing. Um, he is extremely interested in the nonfiction, fiction, and investigative journalism genres. He hopes to pursue a career in either of those fields after receiving his undergraduate and graduate degree. The piece that he has contributed for this panel is a creative nonfiction piece inspired by his grandfather's childhood. Sorry, I actually she. She, okay, I wondered, but I was I was reading what we were given, so oh, okay. <laughs> sorry um, about that. No, that's okay. <laughs> right. um, yeah, so my piece is about my um, grandfather's childhood and it is titled Signed, Sealed, Betrayed. And thank you again, you guys, for joining to hear us read. It's all, it's such, a nice thing that we could all get together to do this, um, even though we are physically apart. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so here it goes. This is a story of a man whose fate of life was decided by the universe before he even got the chance to breathe his first breath. My grandfather, Sia, Don George Hetiarchi, was born into a family that was cursed from what had seemed like the very first start of their bloodline. Sia's family was blessed with money and with titles. However, when it came to happiness, they never had the luxury of being blessed with it by its presence. His father, Don Matthew Hetiarchi, was the leader of the village, Kalulag village, and a prominent businessman. Sia's mother, Antoinette, was a lady of the village. However, since she lacked an education, she occupied her time as a homemaker. Her pride and content existed in her perfected home cooking, which sent into the rest of the village an aromatic mix of roasted spices, complemented by locally derived sweetness through bees' honey that was so thick and sticky. Following these fragrant masterpieces was the unbelievably soft appearance and lingering smell of coconut milk. Its richness was in its color, which appeared whiter than the authentic saltwater pearls on her neck. Then, of course, there was a lavender and lime smell of the freshly done laundry by the local river, whose water was so clear that every speck of moss was visible to the naked eye. This was her gift to her family and the senses of the people who happened to live nearby. Her husband, Don Matthew, owned a rubber estate and a gem mining business. His greatest success was with his rubber estate, as he owned a factory where they manufactured rubber sheets and sold them to international distributors for exportation. During this time of his existence in the early 1900s, 
the three main sources of country's revenue were rubber, tea, and coconut. As mentioned before, titles and money blessed my grandfather's family, but the only things that were consistent in their lives were heartache, betrayal, and murder. The story began when Sia was 10 years old. His father was murdered at gunpoint by his second cousin over a land dispute. Don Matthew did not have a strong familial connection with his cousin because of a falling out that they had due to the rubber estate and gem mining business being inherited by Don Matthew as opposed to his cousin. In Sia's uncle's eyes, the only way to satisfy his hatred for his cousin was at the hand of murder. However, Sia's uncle eventually paid for his crime by being murdered himself for owing money to the wrong people in that village. However, Catherine, Sia's aunt, felt the need to finish what her husband had started. She used her sons, Aish and Sangha, as pawns for her destruction. Catherine told her sons to get close to Sia and his siblings so that once her sons earned their trust, she could begin her plans for their end. Sia had one younger sister, Eugene, one younger brother, Michael, and one older brother, Peter, all of whom had a growing hunger for the inheritance of the estate and would have done anything to protect it. Being aware of their dedication towards the estate, Catherine knew that the only way she could tear them away from their inheritance is by doing the unthinkable. Michael had epilepsy, and knowing this, Catherine decided to use, the, use that to her advantage. She told Aish to take Michael swimming one day when Sia's mother had left the house to go oversee the factory on the production rate for that day. Aish went over to the house when he knew that no one would be home. When he got there, he asked Michael if he wanted to go for a swim down by the river before anyone got home and told him he couldn't. Michael was tempted by the thought of what he, by what he thought was a rebellious act of fun and decided to go to the river with Aish. At first, splashes of the cold water and clear, clear, cold and clear water echoed through the hollow path of the river, and people passing by smiled and appreciated the sign of what seemed like youthful innocence and fun. A little while into their swim, Michael had one of his epileptic attacks. Aish, instead of calling for help or saving his cousin, fled the scene. Of course, no one would have heard screams for help from Michael as he was seizing and drowning. Later on, upon his body being found and the scene being analyzed by the village police to the best of their ability, his death was of course viewed as an unfortunate accident as he was epileptic and by the river by himself. Nobody in the family knew that Aish had asked Michael to go to the river and those of whom saw the two boys playing in the river were too afraid to say anything because they thought it wasn't their place and didn't want to deal with any further investigative protocols. A few months had passed after Michael's death, Sia and his family had tried their best to hold themselves together. Little did they know that this was just the beginning of an indescribable journey of heartache. The house that sheltered my grandfather's fragile family had a colonial style architecture to it. Being that they were conquered by our current British business partners until 1948, everything in that, that the light touched was influenced by the British nature. Of course, Sri Lankans found a way to add their own individualistic fares to their belongings to ensure a slight aspect of self-security and independence. Almost all the houses in the villages, similar to my grandfather's, built their homes with significantly low entryways and ceilings. They did this so that white people who entered their homes would have to bow, as they were significantly taller than Sri Lankan people. The average height for a Sri Lankan was most five feet and seven inches, and that by itself was a stretch. By having their white guests bow their heads in their homes, Sri Lankan people were able to receive respect and independence through, do, through indirect yet noticeable ways. My grandfather's childhood home bore the same build. It also had a wonderful yard that stretched out into an ever-ending site of greenery embroidered by flowers and fruits. Among the colorful display of flowers and fruits were palm trees, coconuts, and of course, rubber trees, whose milk would permeate the house and anyone else's house within a three mile distance. Strangely enough, that subtle smell of tasteless milk brought comfort to the hearts of many people, especially my grandfather's family, as it was the only sign of stability and good fortune available in the midst of these chaotic instances. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you so much. Excellent. Okay. And then finally, we're welcoming Ruth Young who is a graduating senior with a major in geography. She is currently located in Chicago and originally is from Seattle, Washington. During her time at DePaul, she is focused on science communication, travel writing, and creative writing. Hello all. So uh, I will be reading to you the first page of a four page essay titled Establishment Blues, which is a story about my dad and his transition from a very uh, conventional life to a very unconventional life. 
a transition which is paralleled by my own coming of age and emergence into the world of politics and culture. And I would describe his new unconventional lifestyle to be one that is both grounded in skepticism and anti-establishment thinking. So uh, the story begins. It is 2002 in a suburban Seattle garage packed full of 30 years worth of rarely used tools. Whatever you were looking for was guaranteed to be in the hardest spot to reach in the last place you looked. I've spent a lot of time in that garage, although not nearly as much time as my dad, searching for something I know is there. Chaos would be putting it mildly. Shelves leaned out into what were once walkways and now are just shorter piles of boxes, furniture, hockey gear, and construction tools. The garage is my father's brain. The ideas that have been given to him and rejected by him piled up high. Above the unfinished garage is a finished room, which served as my dad's office. On the evenings he wasn't traveling for work, he worked from home in that office. On those evenings when I sensed dinner was ready, I crept out of my room to see what my mom was making in the kitchen. I'd set the table and she would send me to tell dad dinner is ready. No matter the weather, I would scamper barefooted out the front door across a concrete patio, stained with rain, lichen, and sticky blobs of white pine sap fling open the office door and gaze up a flight of steep carpeted stairs. They scared me a bit because my mom had fallen down them once, but they didn't scare my dad and he was the one afraid of heights, so I suppose they must be safe enough. Once I had eavesdropped long enough to determine he wasn't on a conference call, I shouted up the stairs. Dad? Yes, Ruth? Dinner? Okay, I'll be right in. Slam. A few minutes later, the front door would swing open. He would stride across the open room to the kitchen sink, commenting that, smells good in here. The three of us would sit down to dinner where only he talked, both my mother and I being too shy to break silences. Was he happy during this time? I've never asked. I don't know if I could handle the answer. A cushy nine to five software salesman job without a commute, a happy family, a space of his own, certainly wasn't anything to turn one's nose up at, but for a contemplative, critical thinking dreamer whose belief system changed as rapidly as he could learn, at the very least, this was a dull and unsustainable lifestyle. Little did we know that then. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. This is really fascinating to listen to individually and also um, in a collective. So um, if anyone has any questions that you'd like to ask, please use the chat function at the bottom or you can just wave your, wave your hand as well, although we can't see many of you. Um, I wanted to start with, um, with the title of the panel, you know, Political Lineages. And I was thinking about, you know, the um, kind of feminist movement's rallying cry of the personal is political. And I couldn't help thinking that the familial is also political, right? And so I wonder if you might each talk a little bit about, I mean, how much were you thinking about politics, about the political elements of, um, of your story at the time you were writing um, or your narrative? And, um, and what do you think now of, you know, about writing in this particular moment and resharing overtly political pieces at this particular time in which we're living. So maybe we could just go in the order that um, you presented in beginning with Sue. Yeah, I, so reading it again, I will say was very distinct than when I wrote it first, uh, specifically my first story in which I talk about a historical event in Mexico City called La Cristiada. Um, as a result, a lot of churches, it, it was a it was a civil war. Um, and so reading the words like military tanks running, like going through the streets and 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 thinking about the lines of women trying to get their children baptized at a church before sundown, it feels extremely relevant. Um, because it's literally happening outside as we speak. Um, and so that was a, that was 
reading it like before and practicing, I kind of noticed it, but then reading the words again and having like witnesses, I think was an impactful experience for me. Um, the political was very much a part of constructing these stories, especially because, I mean, these are just two of them. The like the wealth of, of like um, historical knowledge to be gained from family is, is obviously really clear. I mean, each of us has, has like, so, so yeah, the, the political being the personal and the familiar familial is certainly true. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I was aware I was writing a political or a political event, uh, the civil war in, in the tensions between the, the two different sides, the nationalists, uh, the fascist side and the left wing side. Um, but I was honestly just trying to write my family story and unfortunately it was in those circumstances. Um, but definitely, um, although that happened a long time ago, um, we're still seeing those tensions happening today everywhere and, and even in the US. Um, there's a lot of tension uh, between the political sides, like really different uh, points of view and uh, hopefully it doesn't come to anything close to to that, to a civil war or uh, uh, any escalation of, of violence. But it's all very contemporary. I think uh, the political tensions back then are still valid today and we're seeing it every day. Um, so it's very current what we're writing about, I think, all of us. Um, well, of course, when I was writing this at first, it wasn't as impactful for me because I already knew the information that was happening that I was telling. However, reading it to someone who had no idea what this piece is about or um, who my family was or what um, my grandfather witnessed at such a young age, it definitely struck like a resonance within me only because it's, I mean, I put myself outside of who I am and just listened to it as someone who was hearing it for the first time. And I was like, this is a lot to take in and this is something that not everyone can say, oh, that happened to me too. But at the same time, it involves, um, and I think uh, Susanna and Ava said it best, but I also think that it involves that inner, inner um, that the, what's, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The mix, the balance between a familial effect and a political effect, but also how they go hand in hand, depending on the time period of which you were writing in and of course the time period of what you're presenting in. So, um, like, obviously, this doesn't happen as often now back in Sri Lanka, but there are definitely um, political movements that are going on with coronavirus or with just writing in general that affect people in a way that's similar to how my grandfather was affected. Like a lot of family members having to give up um, a lot of their rights to, in terms of financially owned businesses or even stuff that they've had as family heirlooms because that because they can't afford to keep it anymore or that they have to get rid of some stuff to afford the costs of uh, groceries or of stuff that's been rising ever since this pandemic happened. So yeah, I think it's, it's a different impact and it's quite ple pleasant because it's wonderful to see how all these stories kind of share the same um, underlining message of the familial and political balance, but at the same time, the relationship that they share. So it was, it was great. <laughs> great, thank you. Ruth? Yeah, uh, yeah. When I started writing this piece, it was supposed to be about a garage, and then it turned into a lot, a lot more about. Um, I, well, kind of the later parts of it is more how my dad has influenced me in his kind of anti-establishment views. So the next scene is about how um, uh, his uh, kind of disregard for the two-party system and how much he disliked that and didn't feel like that was going to be fair or actually give a voice to the people. Um, and later he's kind of anti-marriage and anti-church um, and anti, just so like anything that kind of has established an authority is kind of something that he is uh, not really taken to and how that has influenced me. So I do feel like um, our families and our family's histories and our family's beliefs are passed down so much and kind of ingrained in us as well. So I feel like in that way, yeah, familial is political. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. If anyone else has a question, feel free to wave or to put it into the, um, Chris, did you? Yeah, I just want to ask you all, um, 
how you think um, both stories in general, um, but also uh, specifically familial stories um, can affect political change. Um, or if you think they can't, um, then that would be very interesting too. Uh, but yeah, uh, like, like how does, uh, uh, like both sharing your familial stories with other people, but also just, um, you know, your grandparents or your parents telling you um, stories, how can that affect change politically? I will say in, the wake of everything of all the protests that are happening right now i've really been thinking of ways to talk to my family effectively and 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 what i've landed on most often is like moments of solidarity between my family history um where i can learn um and also like so for example my own great grandfather was a political prisoner under the regime of Castro. And a lot of my family is Cuban refugees. Um, so we have a close relationship to incarceration and to living under a really um, oppressive regime. And that, and that pain is really palpable. And I, and I think when, when I've thought about talking to my family, I've thought about and I'm trying to put everything together, which is why I haven't done it effectively yet. But I'm trying to like build like, we, our family survived through this really horrible thing. And now we can understand how to better support black people in our communities who have also been through similar things. And where we can say, this is our moment of solidarity and this is where we can learn from you too. Um, and so that's what I've been thinking a lot about in these past few days is, is, is others points of connection yeah yeah good did other panelists want to take up that question um yeah i'll say that i think um family stories are one of the most powerful things because they're so close to our hearts and i think we all want to write stories for our own families and all our own circumstances and things that we went through and i think that's a good way because so many other people probably went through very similar situations, or maybe not even, but they can probably relate to, to those circumstances and those probably mostly painful and, 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 and difficult situations. And I think that's a good way of, of uniting people with similar stories or similar feelings. And, and you can really unite and, and, and push for a change and, and make sure that those stories don't, re like stories don't repeat themselves. And, um, we look for a brighter for our future. Mashi and Ruth, did either of you want to add anything? Uh, sure. I, th I think on my standpoint, um, writing a familial story that has deep rooted political issues in it as well kind of reassured my political stance in a way. Um, I, I know this doesn't speak to everyone. However, when you write something and you put it, actually put it down physically, you're inclined to believe it because it's coming out of you. So when you, when you write something, you're convincing yourself and reassuring yourself that this is what you believe in and this is what you've understood through these experiences that your family members have had in the past or having now or your um, classmates or your uh, the people that share the same generation with you are experiencing right now with these riots, it reaffirms and reassures the political standpoint that you have inside you, yet this is the first time that you get to put it down and share it with people through the aspect of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, I'd just like to bring up uh, something actually a panelist said earlier, but in regards to climate change about a similar question is that stories have a way of sticking with us and in a way of making us sympathetic to things that we would not otherwise be sympathetic to. I think um, stories about family uh, do that especially well. So I think if you are trying to uh, inform someone or share a perspective with them that they wouldn't under otherwise understand, I think a story is a very powerful way to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, good, thank you. Um, we have a couple of good questions here. The first from um, Professor Ted Anton, who says, these are such important stories. How did you each do your research? 
I guess since we're going in order, um, my research was very simple. Uh, it was listening. Um, the story of my grandmother being run through the streets of Mexico by her mom in a, in a you know, a tablecloth and being baptized very quickly and not even having a birth certificate. That was one of the last stories that she told me before she passed away. And when I heard it, I was like, wow, that's crazy. And then it hit me like a couple, maybe a year later, like that, that is pretty crazy. Um, and then to know how anti-establishment my own great grandmother was, I mean, she had some um, offensive views, but to, to know like her ferocity was important for me. Um, and then, I mean, the story about my dad being recruited by the IRA was really just a, like a blip that he told me once that was like, yeah, I was on college campus and the IRA walked up to me and I had recently watched um, the show Dairy Girls, which is very much about, about um, the IRA and the provost and was like, it's actually very silly for me to think of, of my, you know, very sensitive writer, poet, dad, being a revolutionary. And, and I think he, he definitely holds a revolution in his own mind. Um, and I'm just being nice because he's listening right now. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, yeah, I did a ton of research because, as I said, my grandma remember really li very little about uh, his older brother because she was only three when he died and it was like a taboo in her family. So she, she didn't know anything, uh, didn't want to talk about it. So I had to, I, I spoke with um, some aunts and uncles that their or uh, cousins and uh, that they kind of knew anything. So I was asking a lot of members of my family if they knew anything about this. And I, ultimately I had to do research in the internet because I found a bunch of information I did not expect and ended up uh, using a lot of that for the story. And, I know things that not even my grandma knows. I, I didn't want to tell her too because I was going to upset her, but uh, we discovered a lot of things uh, we didn't know about. So that was really crazy. Um, but yeah, I interviewed my grandma mainly just because um, I've never been to her hometown and I have to, uh, just for the context and the details and, and the setting, I have to really uh, ask her. But it was really painful because she was still so upset about it. Her brother was only 16 when he died in the war. And it was such a painful thing for her. I was actually scared of upsetting her too much because she's, she's so old. And I was like, oh, this is not a good idea. Even my, my mom was like, you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, but I thought it was a, a story that needed to be told. Uh, so I did it anyway. <laughs> yeah, you should be doing it. Yeah, I, th I thought I had to. Yeah. Good. Um, for me, it was um, mostly memory of stuff that I've just talked to with my grandfather over the years. And... Uh, some of inquiry from my mom as well. Um, I wish I could have had like direct quotations from my grandfather and uh, like now, but unfortunately he passed away a few years ago. So it was basically just stuff that's been in my head or memory and then reassurance and confirming them from my mom. <laughs> so. <laughs> For me, mine was just uh, from my memory. I think if I had interviewed my dad and asked him questions, he would have come up with a completely different story. So that'll have to be for another time. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, and then another question we have is, do you all consider the current moment as the pivotal source of the stories you will be telling your future families? Well, that question's for my dad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, future family, we'll see. If I do have children, this is absolutely going to be a vital part of how I, I, I want, um, I want to remember this moment in my life, not only because I'm graduating right now and really good things are happening, but really important things are happening. And, um, I definitely want to try to break a cycle within my own life. And if I ever have kids, that'll be a very important part of it. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. It's, it's such a historical moment, um, not only for the, this country, but for the whole world, because back, um, back in Spain, there everyone's supporting it too, and, and, and just the whole world is like really watching what's going on, and it's like a pivotal moment in history for, for better, for change, 
and I'm sure we'll we'll be writing about this, you know, in a few years. Mm. Yeah. I believe for me, um, I would definitely tell the story of when I was in college and then all of this just decided to unveil itself. But um, I more so think the reason why I would speak about it is that it's the first time, well, even though there have been other realizations, but this is the first time where you just kind of put down your guard and realize that this is still going on and you are in this totally different century and totally different time time zone and um, cultural belief or cultural standing, whatever it is, you're here and you just have to look back and think, everything that I learned about in high school that happened so long ago, or everything that I learned about in college in, on behalf of um, racial equality or systematic racism is so apparent in my life today that it's kind of heart-wrenching to realize. So I hope that when I do speak to my children about it, it's not something that I'd be saying, oh, as you may know, like it happened the other day, um, this and this happened when I was in college, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is certainly the most pivotal moment of my lifetime so far. So yes, I expect it is going to be something that we've talked about a lot in the future. And uh, to go off the next question, I have been journaling about yeah, every through the pandemic to now, and it's it's a lot. And I'm uh, yes, I'm definitely trying to keep a record of what I'm feeling, what's going on, something to look back on in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you for um, moving on to the next question, which was, do any of you keep journals to remind you of stories? So do others want to jump in with that one? I can start. I don't keep a journal myself. Um, but I am very lucky in that a few of my family members have done a pretty difficult task of, of writing down our family history and putting it into books. And so I have like a couple different and I have like Wikipedia pages and stuff on family members. It's like, okay, I will, I have all of this, um, which is really useful. Journaling, um, is a daily effort and one that I have not really put, um, as a priority, but maybe, um, once I have a lot more free time, I'll be able to do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't journal either. I, I probably should because, um, when stories come to mind, I kind of forget about them um, after a while. So it would probably be a good idea to write stuff down. But as the sun says, it's just too much effort sometimes. And there's so much other things to do with it. Um, so it's also like writing, a, I think it will feel like, write, like writing a diary. I feel like I'm too old for that. <laughs> but I don't know, I think it, it could, I could probably pick it up sometime. Mm -hmm. I think for me, um, and I do this with a lot of other things too, I don't journal, that is a confession. I've been meaning to, it never happened. But um, I think for me, when I do come up with story ideas or as just something pops up in my head, I always just pull out my phone and speak into it and like record it in the most broken English form that you could find. I don't even have thoughts formed, but it's just something that I can go back and think, oh, I did say that, or, oh, that's right, I was gonna write about it, yeah. See, I would I would consider that journaling though, right? I mean, I think the point of journaling is to kind of capture. It's unfortunate that there's so much guilt that goes along with it that I think is connected to diaries, right? Because we feel like, oh, I should be doing this every day. But I think if you just think of it as a kind of a way of just catching thoughts and ideas and inspirations that are going through um, through you. Um, we might find that we do it a little more, sometimes email even, or uh, text messages that we're sending creates a kind of journal, right? Captures those interesting moments. It's good. Any uh, other questions or any other final comments? I would like to echo what I'm seeing in the, in the comments on the side that, um, that you're all such talented writers and that this was really wonderful getting to listen to these stories and especially getting to hear you talk about um, the making of them. Yeah. Anything else? All right. I think, I think that's the end. So yay, congratulations to everyone on a really wonderful conference. Congratulations to you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Um, welcome. And congratulations to the graduates. So Yay! <laughs> Yay! Yay! Okay. thanks everybody. Um
Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to sign us off then. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Great job. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.